Professor Li Zhenbang uh, teaches in Hong Kong Polytechnic University. Uh, he was born in Pingdong, Taiwan, and got his PhD in sociology from the University of Chicago. And he taught at National University of Singapore and also had a postdoctoral fellowship at Harvard Kennedy School. So before entering the academy, he also worked at a community university in Taiwan and participated in several social movement organizations in Taiwan. Now, Zheng Bang, it's your turn. Okay, uh, thanks for Hyrun's introduction. Uh, and also, Sarah ha uh, has given us a very good opening. So my topic for today is uh, I told, can we avoid the war in the Taiwan Strait? And so also I long introduce, I'm from, I was born in Taiwan and from uh, graduate from the National Taiwan University. So that's um, just like, you know, many Taiwanese, we are quite worried about the situation and the worsening situation. So um, my points for today's presentation are very simple. I just have three uh, points, one to elaborate. The first one is who wants war? The second is what kinds of wars? And the third point I want to elaborate is when is the war? I think that's the most of people are concerned about. Will the war be uh, next year, two years later, or something like that? So who wants the war? So my basic point is not definitely not Taiwan or Taiwanese, but from my point of view, it's the U.S. and uh, it's a representative or the so-called I would term it's the U.S. collaborators. Right now that plenty of this kind of the U.S. collaborators in Taiwan. They are in their uh, really primary interest to wage the war and to have the war. And what are the U.S. interests in the war? So as Sarah already introduced, right? They said the U.S. is one of the most militant, militant empires, I would say, in the human history. So the history of the U.S. is a history of war. So I'm not saying uh, without evidence. So that's a, you can quickly Google this from Wikipedia. So in the very short, like 200, 200 years history, right? That's the US, that's a very, very few years that's a without war. So even if the US was not in war, so it was on the road of making profits from war. So there is a, like, you know, the several studies conducted in the 1940s and 1950s. There, uh, here is just one example from the uh, Thomas Beeson, a journalist and reported on 1940s. That's a before that's a U, uh, Japan that's a, has a Pearl Harbor war. That's a US has made a huge profit from trading with Japan, supporting Japan with a lot of the raw material. That's a, most of the raw material are supporting uh, Japan's aggression that's in China. So that's a, from, this, from Thomas Beeson's point, that's the US should be responsible for the very aggressive, you know, the Japanese aggression that's in China. So the potential war in Taiwan served numerous interests from the US side. And Sarah already, you know, elaborated some of the point, right? Interrupting China's development, strengthening its control over its hostage countries like Japan or South Korea. And uh, most importantly, solving its internal capital resistance crisis. So the nature of the war, I will argue that uh, it will be a war between the proxy of a hegemonic capitalist empire and the rising power with an independent and autonomous political and economic agenda, i.e. China, that uh, try to pursue an uh, autonomous and independent economy developing agenda. So I find that's the current situation, that's uh, the Lenin's, that's the 1916 book, Imperialism, the high stage of develop uh, of capitalism, still provide a very very relevant you know, the point to our analysis of today's situation. So that's uh, in this book, in this short book, uh, the the several Lenin makes several points. Right, the first point is that the monopolization of the global market. Example, the U.S. for example, that's uh, you know the uh, why the U.S. want to you know kind of mean the wage the war. That's uh, in the past. The first one is try to monopolize the raw material at the global market, right? So from the early 90, uh, 19th century to 1930s, I've had almost like three decades of the, you know, the continuous war and the armed conflicts in the Latin America. And later on, people call it the banana war. So, but most of people forget this history. Then I think that the banana war that uh, can be quite relevant, you know, to, you know, understand today's, you know, the East Asian situation as a white, 
the U.S. you know want to wage the war, that uh, the the trade war against China, especially in the high tech area, right? The second one is the uh, Lenin Max in this book is the emergence of the financial capital that, that replaced the industrial capital. But there are some new change from Lenin. The first one is, I would say is a complication of the international financial system, e.g. the introduction of the national bond in the US. So that's the, also the creation of the so-called uh, the US dollar hegemony right? and uh, we, we, we know this. So the US survived through the debts that purchased by the war. And uh, in this kind of circulation of the dollar, that's uh, to sustain the dollar system. But the new empire, e.g. US, doesn't fully rely on the physical occupation, like you know, the, the old empire. Although the US still de facto occupy and control many, many, foreign, many foreign countries of society. I would say, uh, right now, U.S. is not only used this you know, kind of in the invincible armed force or well, the physical force, but it's also rely on what I call it's the empire of the mind, right? The U.S. is a new empire built upon Winston Churchill's idea. The empire of the future is the empire of the mind. So how does it, the U.S. achieve this in the global and especially in Taiwan from a Taiwanese point? The first is through the pro-U.S. regime's government propaganda. The second one is through the mass media and the so-called public opinion survey. So there are plenty of the public opinion survey conducted every day in, in Taiwan and try to, you know, convey a point that's how Taiwanese that's a want to support the, you know, the U.S., you know, the strategies in defending, in, in uh, uh, weaponized in Taiwan. And the third one is through the higher education, especially social science. So that's a, I was in this field, so I know that's a, how certain kind of topic are especially prefer that's a, to be taught in the school, like democracy and what democracy, what the bright side democracy can bring, the U.S. style of democracy can bring to the to the Taiwan, uh, to the Taiwanese people, and how China is a, is a opposing you know, kind of in the countering side that's a, you know serve as the 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 the, the, the negative uh, point. And the fourth one is through its dominance in the value commodity chain of technology. So that's a, uh, because of the time limits, I can really, I cannot really elaborate or explain this point, but the TSMC, the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, relocation to the US uh, several months ago. That's uh, is one of this kind of example that's, uh, you know, through kind of monopolizing on you know, the upper spring of the commodity chain that the US are able to, force some of the you know this kind of in the uh, global the, the company that's uh, uh, situated locating at you know the low stream and to relocate to to the US. So it creates an ideological effect. So for many Taiwanese people as for um, as far as I know and as many people I, I was you know kind of talking talking with there is a kind of ideolo ideology. The first is the US is invincible. There's uh, no one Many people can say that you know the PLA People's Liberation Army is really weak because they lack of experience. But no one will really talk about that uh, the US is kind of uh, the can be you know defeated. That's uh, no one really in Taiwan really believe this point. The second point is that the US is democratic and therefore peaceful, just and free. I think that uh, many Taiwanese believe this, and so that's uh, whenever that uh, you want to say that uh, you know China. For provide some of the you know the value that's a uh, several uh, offer to us at the open remark that you know China bring a more like a independent developing strategy or China's uh, democracy is actually centered upon the uh, egalitarian principle, but no one really believes this. That's uh, from Taiwan side, and however, this ideological effect need material base to support e.g. the higher education system, the mass media propaganda machine. So my third point, when is the war? From my perspective, I would argue the war has already begun. So because that's a, in Taiwan, that's a, you know that there is plenty of the, right now at the current time, there's a plenty of the ideological cognitive war against China. So. Uh, one of the very popular ways to, you know, for this kind of a cognitive voice stigmatization. So, for example, they will use some like dirty words to quote Chinese, and so that's uh, in this way they demoralize China, and even so, you know, try to 
uh, link China with some of the barbarian you know, kind of tribe or you know, some of the, you know, the insects such as this and spreading rumors. So there's kind of I mean, there plan every day that uh, if you open, turn, well, turn, on, the TV, like the turn on the TV program, you will see a lot of the, you know, the mainstream TV program that's a spreading, spreading a rumor. For example, on the bottom right side, there is uh, the mainstream newspaper. There's uh, you know, always uh, every summer, they were spreading a rumor saying the, uh, the three gold tank will be brought, will be, will be broken, but not for, Many several of years, you know, the the three gauge then still are still there, and so one is downplaying the development of China. So that's you know they tell the people they say, don't trust you know the development of the economy development of China. The government statistic of the Chinese uh, from from China is unreliable. So even skepticism on the U.S. is not allowed. It's a reason a recent political you know, kind of campaign that's a one of the candidates, that's a the potential presidential candidate that's a to uh, next year, that's a say that Taiwanese should not stop the US because the US is the only country we can rely on. So he said that uh, all of the people like me, if I say something bad to the US, I'm not trustworthy. That's a, so he announced this point that's a probably. So, since the cognitive force has already begun, so the next is to follow U.S. suggestion to enhance its own, the Taiwan's own defensive power. For example, the increase in military spending that uh, we already see in the past several years, and the extension of the military conscription uh, two months ago from three months to one year. I, some people will believe that will extend this to even one half a year or two years. And but. China never says that it has a clear schedule of military action, but it is the U.S. that always released the potential day of the, you know, the, the China will invade Taiwan. For example, there you can find plenty of this kind of in the prediction from the, uh, from the U.S. side, 2000 to, uh, uh, 20, uh, 2025, 2027, or to, uh, before 2030. So you will see plenty of this kind of prediction that's uh, by different kind of think tank or by the defense department. So my last thought, can Taiwan and China resist the US war invitation? Uh, uh, like, like the case in the Ukraine, the US may use abnormal procedures to involve tension, right? The bombing of the Nord Stream. So there are potential way US could you know, force Taiwan or force China to be in a war or to be in a conflict. I think that it's quite possible and many people predict this uh, and uh, but actually, we don't know the, what is the place uh, if U.S. want to choose this kind of I mean, the, the method. The second point, the second thought is that can the U.S. president really control the mini U.S. military industrial complex? I really you know doubt this point because it's a from a lot of you know the kind of I mean, the the clue that I, I really doubt the, the the U.S. you know the politician can control this kind of I mean, the huge huge uh, MIC. So the U.S. style democracy has become anti-democracy, and I think this point uh, is quite uh, has a deep roots among many Chinese people, especially in recent years, seeing the kind of I mean, the 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 tightly anti-irrational anti-Chinese sentiment by the U.S. politician, and uh, the U.S. MIC is anti-human, and uh, for my point, anti-civilization. So it's try to you know build explains military influence and also in the way to create a circulation of the US dollar. So the East Asia NATO, I think that uh, it's quite possible because Japan and the South Korea has shown the interest to join or to build the uh, East Asia NATO. And uh, my last thought is that, can China offer an alternative view to the, of the future, of the future world to the global society will be the key that's uh, in this kind of I mean, the for longing or lengthening kind of in the, the struggle um, kind of in the battle uh, again against the U, uh, against the U, the US. So the U reunion, but from that's my own perspective, is that the, re the reunion of Taiwan to China will be the new step in China's long quest since the 18th century because that's a uh, we the China the Taiwan officially was forced to the so-called global market. Of so-called global capitalist system 
is by the unequal treaty of the Tianjin Treaty as after 1850s. So it's almost 200 years. And I think that's uh, from Chinese people, many Chinese people point or perspective is the liberation of the reunion of Taiwan really marks a new beginning of this past 200 years of the colonial history. And uh, although the semi colonial history or something, this kind of in mean, the very, very sad history that uh, China is always under the kind of in mean, the foreign force, the aggression. That's my point. Thank you. I'm Michael Hudson. I'm appearing here for the International Manifesto Group. If you like this video and want to like it, please subscribe. For more information, go to the address on the screen.